Hey guys, it's Kevin with Mix Coach. This is the episode number 101 of the Mix Coach podcast. Today on the podcast is another excerpt from a question and answer session that we had with some of our, some of our members at Mix Coach member. And it's why we record multiple passes of orchestra and tips for mixing synths to sound like orchestra. So if any of that uh, sounds like uh, something you might want to know, stay tuned and listen to the podcast. Hey, uh, Kevin, first of all, thanks for covering strings on that uh, tutorial. Uh, I've been working on uh, my sample library strings here on some of my own compositions, and it's just silk, made them real silky and nice. So you, you give me an idea with your settings in the tutorial that uh, allowed me to uh, tweak them in where I, they sound just great. Okay, cool. What That's did you awesome. do? Just curious. I watched your tutorial and took your settings as a as a, a setup, and I took um, I got Vienna String Library and also uh, East West Hollywood Strings, and so I blend those two together, and then uh, basically treat them as if I got tracks from you, you know, that were recorded live, and I'm getting a pretty good sound, like they sound live. It's good. good. Of course, a lot of that's in the programming too. You know, getting getting them to sound that way. But yeah, yeah. It is. yeah but the, I was I was never happy with the EQing that I was able to do. So you really set me in the right direction. So the two the minus two K thing that help you or? Yes. Okay. Cool. That, I know that was a that was a revelation to me. And actually, I can't really take credit for that. A friend of mine who I was mixing for it's the first time I ever mixed strings. He said, "Let me show you a trick." And um and we took 2K out and it smoothed the strings way out. So yes, yeah, so I, I, I I've got a couple questions. Okay. One is why on the on the real strings did they do three passes when they recorded them? What what is the purpose? Um well it's that's a, that's a pretty normal thing. Um but that section is not that big. The section is actually I think it's two by uh, two first two. Two violins, two first violins, a second violin, a viola, one cello, and one contrabass. So when you put that together, it sounds more like a string quartet than it does an, an ensemble. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we stack that three times for the for the express purpose of making it sound bigger and having a place to put it. I mean, when I record yeah. things, a lot of times I'll I'll try to say, okay, this is going hard left and this is going hard right, so I need one just like that. Same guitar, same tuning, whatever. So the strings are like that. Um, we usually do three passes so that we can do one, you know, if you ch so desire to do it this way, uh, pan one pass to the left, one pass to the right, and one right up the center. Some people do that, and but mainly it's just for the bigness of it. And I'll tell you that these Nashville guys, one of the things that they're really good at this, I mean, the people that play in the smaller ensembles are the guys that stay the busiest. The the uh, you know when you get the other twelve first and second violins, it does sound bigger. Um, but one of the things uh, that I, I thought when I was recording, I forget who, which record it was, and I think you guys have probably already mixed it. But we did three passes of strings, and we did the same thing. We did a, a tall room, a short room, um, and then uh, the violin players. He had two violins in there, or fiddles as we call them in Nashville. And he had two bows, and I said, "So is this just a backup fiddle?" He said, "No, I use that on the second pass." So even the string players, they know that it will sound like twin fiddles, um, or just a stacked fiddle, uh, if they don't change the instrument, change the intonation, because you would play a different, you would play a uh, a violin differently, a, a different violin differently, and then the third pass, he plays a second violin with a different bow. I mean, so that's how intricate those are to make them sound like three. It, what it's designed for is to make it sound like three instead of uh, two, one, one, and one. It's it sounds like six, two, two, and two. Right. Or no, 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 six. No. Yeah. <laughs> My math is bad, but it makes it sound three times bigger um, yeah. than it was. That's the reason we stack it. Yeah. And it's pretty effective. I mean, it still doesn't sound like a big section because Wayne. Um, we were in LA. John, you were there. Uh, yeah. We were at Capitol, and um, um, I was listening to. I, I wanted. This is what I do. I said, 
uh, let me hear something you love, Wayne. Let me and he let me hear an Andre Bocelli um, string section, and um, I was like, wow. I mean, I have never even been able to mix an orchestra like that. Yep. And so we listened to it. I let Steve uh, Steve uh, Steve at Capitol listen to it, and uh, he said, oh, that was recorded at Sony Studios, and you put uh, a bunch of people, bunch of string players in that room, and it sounds like that. So yep. um, that's when I started to realize that you know. Okay, here's here's a lesson for you. That's when I started to realize that the strings that we recorded this way may never sound like that. It's just mm -hmm. like some of you guys, some of I mean, some of you are not this way, but some of you guys have never, maybe before mix coach, have never mixed a well recorded set of tracks. I mean, I'm I'm not right. I, I didn't record all these tracks, but I know they're good because I mix them and I go, hey, these are good. I've heard a lot of tracks. So a lot of you guys have never heard really good tracks until you come to mix coach. And then, and then I'll bet you you've seen the what's that commercial, the um, jet commercial where the people's minds are blown and it blows up and it's purple. I don't know, you seen that? It's a commercial where they they look at something they've seen for the first time and then their head blows up like this, the top of it. Anyway, so I'm sure that some people, when they mix these tracks, go, oh, that's the way a piano is actually supposed to sound, or that's the way mm -hmm. an acoustic guitar sounds. An acoustic guitar sounds. When it's played by a really good player, it's a really good acoustic guitar. They're in a really good room. Uh, he's in a good pocket, um, mm -hmm. good microphone, good mic preamp, put to tape in a good way. That's what it's supposed to sound like. When a lot of people say, "I don't know why I can't get that sound," when they don't have access to some of the players sometimes. So um, anyway, so that's when I realized that wow, until I record the LA Symphony or the LA Recording Orchestra in Sony. You know, I'm going to have to figure out another way to make it sound like this, and that's when we started kind of padding the strings a little bit, and it's a very effective too. So yeah, you know, if you think about like the physics of of sound, like in that way, um, it's really like if you're recording. So if you record uh, this way, where you have like the smaller ensemble and you record them multiple times, you can get close. But it's like because there aren't that many different instruments with different um, players playing in the same room with their the waveforms from their instruments vibrating around the room all at the same time, what you have recorded just doesn't really combine the same way. Um, so whenever you have, if you have a smaller section of those people recorded uh, four times and then you record uh, the bigger section of those, Oh, you're playing the the mind blown thing. So, hey, I, show you so I don't think you're insane. Yeah, because you looked at me like I was a little funny. I looked at you this like you were time. crazy. Hey, listen to this guitar track. <laughs> oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> All of Anyways, the so I'm not crazy. Okay. Um, so you're not crazy. You're not crazy. Um, but yeah, so the, uh, like it just doesn't work. You know, if you, if you take one thing, if you take one string part, right, one string player and multiply it, you know, a hundred times, it doesn't sound like a hundred piece, uh, orchestra. Um, what it'll sound like is it'll sound closer to a hundred piece orchestra, but it won't sound quite the same, you know? And so it's, it's all of that combined with, you know, the, the waveforms combine in the room to actually, you know, vibrate the, the room in certain ways to where it captures on, on you know, well, tape like that. So That's the thing about the bigger orchestra in a bigger room. When yeah. you put lots of players in a room, that room, uh, the character of that room comes to life. For it's, sure. like a drum, it's like a drum room, the difference between playing drums in a drum room and playing a, a MIDI um, room set. Uh, uh, like a, um, a well, a, a finger pick guitar. Well, those drums excite the room, and they make the room come to life a little bit. And that's why people yeah. compress, you know, rooms to make it more uh, the character of the room come out. So, yeah, um, padding, um, Chuck, padding the stuff is 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 a good call. And I I don't know that I. But on the other hand, you've got all that room, but no really close mic stuff, and no. Um, uh, intonation things that happen with a real player, uh, no different way he played it the second time, the timing missed maybe on one of the passes. That's what makes it between that and the stacked or the or the padded rooms makes it sound really, really believable. Yeah, we should try that sometime. Did you did you check out the ninety nine dollar orchestra thing that I talked about? Yeah, I did uh, look at the website. That's something to keep in mind. Although I 
my goal is to make my performances realistic using yeah. the libraries I have. Yeah. And because I have, uh, what, five mic settings on the East West, including close, yep. you can blend those and, and get a pretty realistic yep. realistic sound. But yeah, that 99 dollar orchestra, that's that's interesting. Something else other, to keep in mind about, I like, other, oh, go ahead, well, go ahead. Well, hey, just, just before you go to that question, um, I know you got another question, but let me just recommend when you get it sounding the way you want it, get one player, just one good player that can read a score, and one part, uh, and usually the high strings. If you can get the first violin, a real part on the first violin, you know how you know how I tell you the um, that the um, the attack principle, the attack principle. You hear the beginning of it, and then your mind already goes like, oh, that's real. That's you know that's that's loud enough in this case. On strings, if you can get the top part to be believable, everybody's mind will just assume that the rest of it's real. So if you if you wanted to do it even cheaper than the ninety nine dollar orchestra, just get a person to do the the first violin part uh, right off the page. Page that'll help too. So yeah. anyway, okay, on with your question. Uh, yeah, the other uh, question is you, uh, you you generally use the SSL channel. But on the strings in your tutorial, you use R channel. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason specifically why you chose the R channel over the SSL? Yeah, I use uh, between the R channel and SSL. That that's my two go-to channel strips. The SSL is more of an aggressive sound for me. The way I set it up with that instant awesome set, and it and it adds a lot of uh, like a snarly sort of grit and attitude to a sound. And a lot of times the strings. Um, I don't want to add attitude to it. I want it, I want it to mellow out. And I find that um, on the R channel, uh, and I'll use this on the snare sometimes too. Um, on the R channel, if I if I want it just to be kind of smooth, uh, that's what I'll use. A lot of times I'll use that on the toms too, just because it's just more versatile than the SSL. The SSL is a nice piece. I love the channel, but it's kind of a it's not a surgical tool, in my opinion. The R channel is more of a surgical tool. Um, and if I just had an SSL channel, I would use it gladly. Uh, it's just, I, you know, I just grab yeah. the uh, the R channel. That, that's more of a, you know, the R channel, uh, I know how to set it up to where I can, you know, uh, make the, you know, side chain the compressor or the gate with uh, the channels that are there. It's got the R box setting. If you wanted to wanted it to be a little bit more aggressive, but yeah, it's just it's just I feel like um, you know it's four bands and you and it's graphic. You can see it, and I know that you shouldn't use your eyes, but I do I do use my eyes when I'm mixing. So it's a little bit more graphical interface. Uh, so I wish I had a better answer than that, but the yeah, SSL is a little bit more aggressive, and the R yeah. channel is a little bit more. Uh, surgical, I guess. Well, absolutely, especially if you get into like the EQ for sure it, on the SSL. It feels like, like you said, it's a little bit more of like broad strokes almost. You know, where it's like if you're thinking about it in 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 terms of like a uh, painting, it's a big brush. Whereas, <laughs> like with like uh, the R channel or even like stock EQs, most of the time they can be very very thin. They can they can get a lot of detail, or you can say I want I want to see it this way. And like you said, with the SSL, there is no like graphical interface on that, so you're basically just trusting you know what you're hearing or whatever. And whereas it's like if you know, hey, I want a bump here, and I want it to look like this. Um, that's why it's easier for me a lot of times on toms to just use like uh, the R channel or the uh, uh, the standard stock EQ on Pro Tools because mm -hmm. you can see I go I I know I want it to look like this you know but I don't you know on on the SSL you have to kind of like go by the numbers and you have to kind of shoot for the middle whereas you can just do it all at once with uh, with something else and so you know that's what the EQ kind of does for me on other things and uh, Chuck well, let me add one more thing. Um, if I only had the SSL, I wouldn't even think twice about it. I would, I would just use it. It's not. Yeah. I don't think you need to go. I mean, it's not that there's a secret weapon built in the R channel that you're not getting with the SSL. It's just I've got all those plugins, yeah. and those are my two go-tos, and that's what I did. I would probably have been just as happy with the SSL, so I wouldn't go and buy another uh, channel strip just because I used one on there. Yeah. Not that you would, but you know, I just you know, now that I'm thinking about it, it's like I don't know exactly why. Yeah. Um, but I do tend to use the R channel as more of a surgical tool. Like, for example, on snare drum, I, I like to see that little 
uh, narrow uh, bell curve when I find the fundamental frequency of the snare and the toms. And also, sometimes on the toms, I like to go in there and listen to the side chain and filter out the side chain so that, that, and that it's right underneath the fundamental frequency so that that frequency is triggering the gate open and not the snare drum. You can't do that on the SSL. Mm -hmm. um, it, I've tried it. it I mean, I, I would probably prefer the EQ better, yeah. but as far as being a better tool, our channel is better for snare, finding that fundamental frequency, mm -hmm. and toms for finding the fundamental frequency and yeah, you, using it to trigger the gate open. You have to use like multiple plugins a lot of times to get that versatility that the R channel has out of the SSL, which is fine. You know, it's just it's a workaround that you can use. I will say, like like Kev said, it's like don't you know? I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily jump on you know. Oh, I need this EQ for this reason because again, the stock EQ on Pro Tools and and most of the stock EQs they they have very they can be narrow cues. Because uh, that's another problem that I have with uh, sometimes with the SSL is that the Q doesn't go super narrow. It doesn't go to like ten. And I, I, sometimes I would need something to go to 10 to like notch something out a little bit or to find that exact fundamental. Um, so, I mean, you know, it, but again, you could, there are, you know, free EQs that, that do uh, surgical things too. It's just the R channel does it and combines these various elements, like you said, like the side chain and, uh, and the EQ in such a way. It's like, it's just easier to use sometimes. The I had the R channel last Christmas with the SSL, so I had them both anyway, Perfect. but okay. I, yeah, I'm learning them, you know, and why you go to one versus the other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, did that, did that clear it up a little bit? I mean, do you? Yeah, yeah, I okay. did. Okay, cool. Appreciate it. Thanks. You're welcome. I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you're uh, uh, a string arranger. Uh, yeah, I man. have a, a fondness for string arrangers. Uh, and mixing that kind of music. So yeah, something uh, I did want to mention earlier. Whenever you were talking about uh, your main goal is to come up with um, a realistic sounding like synths and things like that. So a lot of times I find that the one way that I can tell whether or not it's a uh, a synth orchestra or a um, regular you know natural orchestra is it's sometimes too clean or too perfect with uh, with the synths. Um, so a little bit of a uh, little bit of distortion or like a parallel kind of processing with an exciter on it or something, something to just kind of get it a little bit less, less exact or less like perfect where it's like, oh man, that hit right on the beat and it hit this and that. And you know, if you can get it to where it's a little bit more give and take and a sway there, even to the point of like, you know, you're thinking about strings, you're thinking about a, uh, a section of, uh, violins. They're not all doing their uh, vibrato at the exact same, you know, kind of uh, frequency or the exact uh, rhythm, um, and they're maybe not exactly all perfectly on, you know, 100% the pitch. So it's like, you know, just dirtying it up just a little bit, not not overboard, just a tiny little bit, would, would sometimes helps. So I understand, John. Yeah, the VSL has a, a few patches uh, intonation-wise where. Um, let's say the violins will start in, start out, and they won't quite be in tune, and then they'll get in tune because that's actually how real players play. And then there's some humanistic uh, playing uh, intonation kind of things, start and stop times of the attack. So there's a quite a bit there that does uh, add to the realistic of, of it. Well, and another thing to keep in, in mind too, Chuck, and this is probably, it may just be for us, I don't know, but the, the couple of things that I've noticed is that um, in a real orchestra, the strings tend to play a little sharp on purpose because it's like the attack principle applied to pitch mm -hmm. um, where you notice it. That, that's what they do. They, um, uh, I can tell you that story later, but also I've noticed that the brass tends to play behind just a little bit you think about it, you know, if they're if they're not watching the conductor uh, do it, you know, in in, a, in, a, in an orchestra in its environment, you know, he's probably 20, 30, maybe 40 feet from the conductor, and he's right. probably not looking at his every move and playing like a perfect person. He's probably playing off cues that he hears around him, mm -hmm. and which is late, yeah, a little bit. So, and he's sitting toward the back. Percussion's a little bit back. Um, you know, I don't like to hear percussion behind, but when I record full orchestras, well, it's been a long time since I recorded a live full orchestra, and that was in Prague. But that's where I, I started to see, okay, this is how an actual orchestra sounds. Uh, Chuck, if you really want to get good at it, you know, you, you, as you know, you probably listen to orchestral music 
quite a bit, but there's nothing quite like going and hearing a full orchestra record live. Um, where do and you live, Chuck? Um, I swing in Illinois, just out of Chicago. I used to live in Ann Arbor, and I'd go watch the University of Michigan orchestra mm -hmm. playing. Of course, I performed in an orchestra too, but it's awesome. different when you're in the yeah. room versus yeah. listening. What do you? Right. What did you play? Just curious. I play uh, sax. I also play uh, keyboards. It's awesome. And then uh, piano. Awesome, man. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's one of those things, like also if you go and watch and, and you know this from being in them, some conductors, um, aren't directly like on the beat. They're a little bit ahead. They're a little bit behind, you know, some of them, it just, it depends on the character or characteristics of the orchestra where kind of those rhythms and beats fall. And so a lot of times with players, it is kind of uh, a, I'm playing by the, by not only, you know, the conductor, uh, who does something and then I hear the cues around me and then I play, you know, then that sort of thing. You're making sure that you're, you're listening to everyone around you as well as perceiving what you're visually watching while you play with these you know, uh, conductors. So it's, it's kind of a, the, there is an ebb and a flow from section to section and, and, and things like that with, uh, with orchestra too. So. The Mixed Coach Podcast takes both submitted questions from our free members and live questions from our pro members. And if you would like to submit a question or find out how to become a pro member, head over to mixcoach.com forward slash free.